Welcome to the Wild Physio Podcast with your host, Andrew Wild. Back by popular demand, I've got Ellie Pashley on again. For the listeners that didn't listen to the first episode, uh, Ellie is a 10,000 metre and marathon runner who represented Australia in the World Championships in Doha last year. She was also a 2021 Tokyo Olympic hopeful after achieving a qualifying time in both the 10K and the marathon. Ellie is also a physiotherapist and I graduated with Ellie from Charles Sturt University back in the day. Some of her PBs include a 226 marathon, a 109 half marathon and a 30 minute 18 second 10K, which is super quick. Huge welcome to Ellie Pashley. Thanks for coming back. Uh, thanks, Wildy. Thanks for having me. You gave me an extra minute on my 10K. <laughs> it was did 31, I? not 30. Yeah. What did I say? You oh, said 30, I? which 30, I'd be very minutes. happy if that was it. <laughs> 31 minutes, 18 seconds to get it <laughs> correct. Yeah. Now let's just dive straight into it because a lot of people reached out to me after the first episode we did and they absolutely loved it. A lot of the runners that I have sent it to and also just people that follow me have listened to it and they got so much out of it. So I wanted to dive into running mechanics today. So things like stride length, where the foot should land underneath the pelvis, that sort of thing. So can you just give us a bit of a breakdown and give the listeners a bit of a breakdown about running mechanics and what creates an optimal running uh, technique and flow? Yeah, so running mechanics is, I think, a really tricky one. And, and we as physios can certainly get a little bit too particular with it because one thing that's important to remember is that people have been running the way that they run often for many, many years. And if you go in and change, try to change too many things, then you're most likely going to overload other tissues, which aren't used to that, that amount of load going through them. So um, I'm always very wary when I do gait analysis on patients and look at their technique on, you know, if they've got an injury and we do need to offload one area, then you can make a few little tweaks. But um, I think you've just got to be really careful with changing too many things or changing something too much. And it, it always needs to be done over time. So that's probably the, the first thing I'd say about that. But um, I mean, optimal, optimal running technique, there's, that's certainly a, um, a thing. And if, if anybody wants to watch a video of Elliot Kipchoge running, that's probably about as perfect as you can get as far as technique goes so the general uh consensus is that if your foot is landing underneath your hip then that is ideal and that will often be uh, like a midfoot to occasionally a forefoot strike um and then just you to want clarify to have nice... just to oh, clarify yeah. as well this is from side on as in the foot landing underneath the pelvis just for the listeners. Oh yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Side on. And even if you're looking from front on, you, you want uh, the foot to be landing almost in line with the side of the hip as well. So um, that's a big thing that we see with some injuries in particular is people have a bit of a crossover gait pattern where their foot swings around and lands almost in front of their other hip. Um, and then, yeah, a nice strong push off phase where people are really utilizing their calves and their glutes is always, is always good. Uh, we want to uh, be a little like, again, everybody's different, but looking at, at people's trunk position as well and the amount of rotation that they've got going on there. So trying to keep shoulders relaxed, back straight. With, with a lot of uh, runners, you'll see there's a little bit of a forward lean, which is okay because that's quite good for assisting with momentum. Um, you don't want to be leaning back too far. That's going to create like a deceleration uh, phase almost when you land. Oh, what else do we need to be mindful of? Um, I guess hip drop. So when, when your foot hits the ground, if, you, if you've got a lot of hip drop happening on your opposite hip as that leg swings through, then you're actually just using it, losing energy through that, that stance phase. So um, you're not getting quite the same rebound effect when you then go to push off from that leg. I don't know, anything else that you think is really no, important, Wildy? No, I think that's really, really well answered. And I think a lot of people ask me the wrong questions when they're talking about running. Like, as in clients, they always ask me, you know, what are, what's the optimal shoe for me? And what's this and what's that? But often it's just the basics, isn't it? And I think one of the big things that's missed by a lot of physios is cadence 
um, just talk to the listeners about cadence and why cadence is so important and what is an optimal cadence? Yeah, so um, generally people find that if they, if they do increase their cadence a little, then they almost fall into a slightly better movement pattern naturally. So increasing your cadence will sometimes actually reduce your stride length, but it means that your foot might land uh, further in underneath your body as opposed to way out in front of your body where you then have to pull your weight forward essentially. Just quickly, just um, define cadence as yeah. well for the listeners. because Oh, cadence. Yeah. Yeah, so steps per minute. Yep. Um, which, yeah, I think they, they say that the optimal cadence is sort of somewhere between 170 and 190 steps per minute. Everybody is quite different with this. And obviously uh, pace comes into it a little as well. So depending on how fast you're running. But yeah, I mean, that's one cue that I'll often give people if they're struggling with particular injuries, like often certain things in their hip or like a tib post injury or knee pain or something like that. It might just be trying to increase their cadence or, or even slightly shorten their strides and taking almost shorter, faster steps as opposed to those big loping strides. So that can be one thing that can automatically almost uh, improve people's gait pattern and engage different muscle groups without them having to think too much about everything that's going on. Yeah, beautifully answered. And yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I sort of work along the lines of 180 cadence plus or minus 10 is fine. I, I find a lot of people are down around that sort of 140, 150, especially people that come in with, you know, foot-based issues, Achilles-based issues, as you said before, tip post. And as soon as you start to increase their cadence and get the legs turning over more often, every step there is a little bit less load going through those structures and it's less of a jump and less of a hop and it's more of a glide. And I think this is really important for people to understand the vertical displacement shouldn't be very high as in the head shouldn't bop up and down a lot. And I give, I give a really good analogy to women that have a ponytail in the ponytail shouldn't be bouncing up and down a crazy amount, should it? because we want the head to effectively stay at a pretty decently neutral position. And there's this beautiful video that I often use for people to understand how they should run of um, Bekele. So obviously he's one of the greats, you know, five and 10 K runner, but also now marathon runner. And he's just got such a beautiful technique and I've showed this video and his head literally just doesn't move. Just explain to the listeners about why the vertical displacement and the head bopping up and down is not what we want. Yeah, well, I mean, if you think about it, when you're when you're running, you're trying to get from one place to another as, as fast as you possibly can. So if you're going up and down as you go, then you're wasting all this energy essentially with a vertical movement as opposed to a horizontal movement. And it's we're really lucky these days, like if you wear a Garmin watch, and I'm sure a lot of the other watch companies are the same, but uh, on your Garmin Connect, you can actually see your vertical oscillation and your cadence and all of those variables just to have a look and I actually often look at the vertical oscillation in mine and it's really interesting that it sometimes gets worse as I get uh, more fatigued which you would think as you get tired you get less sort of bouncy up and up and down but I think I just possibly become a little less efficient with the way I run and um, yeah so that's you're right like Bikili and some of those brilliant runners are a really good example of not wasting any energy with that up down movement and there's there's always going to be a little bit um but yes i guess trying trying to minimize that which increasing your cadence will often help with as well yeah exactly and um a good analogy that i often use is if i lowered the ceiling down to your head height you'd be able to nearly run underneath it without hitting it and that is a really good one to resonate in a lot of people's minds, especially people that do this super big, long loping stride where their foot's landing right out in front of their pelvis and they're bouncing up and down and their head's jumping up and down a lot. So I think that's not a bad um, analogy for people because immediately they're like, oh shit, well, my head would get pretty sore if there was a ceiling there. So <laughs> automatically they're gliding a little bit more underneath the ceiling. So yeah, you hit the nail on the head. I think cadence is really important. Um, well, it obviously is. Now, this is something that I want to discuss now is shoes. 
I think a lot of people think that buying a new pair of shoes or buying the latest and greatest new shoe that's got some mad technology in it, it's going to fix their running issues, e.g. injuries or it's going to make them faster, all this sort of stuff. And I've often done a post on my Instagram, buying new running shoes will not make up for a shit technique. So just go through some running shoe options you do have, why you would choose a running shoe and why running shoes aren't going to make up for a poor technique. Yeah, so these days, I guess we're very um, flooded with options for shoes, which is is great. And again, there are certainly differences with what people need in the footwear department and um, shoes with medial posting, which is like a support on the inside of the heel to, I guess, provide some stability for over pronators and things like that. They, they certainly have their place, but uh, ultimately, I think the best thing that you can be doing is trying to get as strong as possible, both through your feet and then through your lower limbs. Um, because essentially, if, if you're relying on on that sort of technology to, to stop you from rolling in or whatever it is, then there's usually a weakness somewhere up the chain that can be worked on as well. And yeah, there, there are definitely some people with structural issues where they might need that that extra support and what, what I've often seen actually with runners is sometimes in the early stages when they're getting into it and still building strength and things like that, they, they may need, whether it's a little more cushioning or a little more support as their body gets used to the movement and their tissues adapt and they get stronger. But often the more you run and the longer you run for, you actually uh, develop a more efficient style anyway in time and and often you might find you you started in a in a supportive shoe and then you can end up transitioning to something neutral purely through probably whether it's the strength that you gain from running itself but also if you're adding in some strength and conditioning to your to your week as well that can make a big difference so there's endless options with level of cushioning type of cushioning uh, posting carbon plates all those sort of things and and I, I do think it's really important to try and and feel what works for you and what feels best on your foot I mean ultimately you're going to run well in something that's that's comfortable above all else so that's probably something that's above all important when you're picking a shoe is is comfort yeah for sure and there was a, a recent research article that compared uh, more of a midfoot, forefoot strike versus a heel strike. And the conclusion was that it's kind of irrelevant and as long as the foot is landing underneath the pelvis, underneath the hips regularly from side on. That was pretty much the conclusion, which is exactly what I tell most of my clients. If you've been running like that for a long period of time, as in heel striking, if you want to transition into more of a, your barefoot or your midfoot type of style running, it's going to take a lot of time and that's going to potentially aggravate and load other structures. This is my segue into, this is the segue into the next question. So the barefoot movement. So obviously yep. vibrant five fingers, they got, um, they ended up getting sued for misinformation and false advertising. Now, why should you, transition to a barefoot style or why should you never transition into a barefoot style of running? And when I say barefoot style of running, I mean leaning more on your midfoot and forefoot rather than your heel. Um, yeah, I guess if you've got a big stress fracture in your heel, then maybe it's <laughs> 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 time to try and land further forward on your foot. But I don't know. I mean, I worked at a running store when the, the barefoot movement was happening and it was all the rage. And um, yeah, I saw, I saw a bit of a shift in injuries. Um, there were people coming in left, right and centre with Achilles tendinopathies and stress fractures through their metatarsals who had read Born to Run and then decided that they were going to become a barefoot runner in a week. Um, I mean, I, I guess in... <laughs> I think it's a little bit tricky in our society because most of us grew up running uh, with shoes on for the majority of the time. And um, I don't, I don't think there's any problem with wearing shoes. I mean, it's great. I walk around my house barefoot. I try and do some strength work barefoot, but uh, if you're running high mileage, I think it's uh, fairly unrealistic to think that you can run barefoot for a lot of that and not get injured. You know, we're, not, we're probably not really made to be running well over a hundred K's a week uh, 
without shoes on. I don't, I don't think that was ever really the intention for the human body. So I think uh, from my point of view, wearing footwear to protect your feet is, is definitely beneficial in reducing the risk of injury. But I mean, there are certain injuries where it, it might be beneficial for you to use barefoot running as a tool to strengthen, whether it's your foot intrinsic muscles, uh, your calves, um, yeah, it can. It certainly changes your activation pattern, and you know you might want to go and try it on the beach or on a footy oval somewhere. But I think it has to be an extremely slow transition. And probably the best thing that I would recommend is having a few different pairs of shoes that you alternate through. So rather than wearing, you know, a big chunky high cushioned shoe all the time, even doing some work in in a lighter. Uh, I guess less cushioned shoe where you're going to change up that load a little bit. So for me, I wear, I tend to wear a bigger, more cushioned shoe for easy runs or second runs or at the moment long runs because I've had a foot injury recently. Um, but then a lot of my other runs are done in, in a fairly lightweight, more flexible shoe where my feet and calves have to do a bit more work. But I know that if I wore them for every run, then I would 100% end up with an injury. So yeah, I think it's, it's good to, to vary the amount of protection perhaps that you have on your foot. But to be honest, I'm not a big believer in the barefoot thing being better. And if you, if you look at, you know, people running marathons and people running on the track now, you do, it's not very often that you see somebody competing at the highest level it, without shoes on. So I'm not really sure why people would think that that's the way to go. Yeah, I completely agree. Beautifully answered. And I think a lot of people, misinterpret a lot of the information and the reality is most of us that have grown up in the 80s 90s 2000s have grown up in chunky heeled shoes you know they those chunky heeled shoes came out in the sort of the 80s late 70s i think and the idea was to reduce injury but it actually hasn't changed the rate of injury much and i think a lot of the time what we've got to do is manage the training volume obviously tighten the technique up a little bit um, and just relying on a new pair of shoes to change something like an injury or something like that isn't the wisest idea. One other thing to note is, I think you hit the nail on the head as well in terms of longer distance stuff. If you're doing longer Ks and longer distance stuff, I think, yes, having a little bit of cushioning under the heel is very wise because, again, there was some research done where they had a look at marathon runners and inevitably a marathon runner, even if they're landing on their forefoot and their midfoot at the start of the race, towards the end of the race, once they're fatiguing, they will start to heel strike. So in that regard, it makes complete sense that yes, you would use different types of shoes for different runs, but especially your longer runs, going for a shoe that's got slightly more of a drop, sorry, slightly yeah, more of a drop and more, of cushion, more cushioning in the back of the heel would be a good idea. So I also give this analogy to clients as well. Like you said, I think having the different pairs of shoes for different runs is really good. Much like a golfer, a golfer isn't going to use the same club over and over again. It's dependent on the situation and dependent on the run. You need to have a different pair of shoes for some runs. So I think that's really wise advice. You would agree? Yeah. I think it's, um, yeah, it's a lot of it too is just about varying that load because, it, mm. yeah, it's, I think doing, doing it the same way all the time isn't necessarily good because yeah, you might be missing out on some strength gains or adaptations in other areas, but mixing up that load, then you would hope that in the end you end up with a fairly um, good overall strength and stride and gait pattern. Hmm. Yeah, for sure. And with all these things that we're talking about, it depends. And I think this is why you need to go and see a professional like you or myself that is a physio, a strength and conditioning coach, a running coach. This is so important. Don't just think uh, it's a one size fits all approach across the board. Everyone needs to do things slightly different depending on the person, depending on the goals, et cetera. So I think it's really important to do that. One more thing about running coaches. I think let's dive into this just quickly, Elle. Um, learning yep. to run. I think a lot of people get taught how to play tennis or play netball or um, play golf or cricket or whatever growing up, but a lot of people just never get taught to run and they think they deserve to be able to run as long as they want and they shouldn't get injured and they shouldn't need to be taught how to run because we were born to run. And the fact that that book in itself by Chris McDougall is called Born and Run, a lot of people think that they can just run and they were just born to do it. But 
no one learns. A lot of people just don't learn how to run. How important is it to learn how to run? Because there are so many um, nuances with running technique. Yeah, I think, I guess there are two sides of that. I, I, I do think it's important and it would be good if it was something, perhaps it was taught to to kids growing up. Yeah. And even, I, I guess, a lot of people come, come into running in adulthood having never really done it before. But I guess sort of like I said before, I do believe that if you do it for long enough, uh, you will gradually become more efficient anyway and your gait will improve I think there are there are some cues that can be really helpful around arm swing and even yeah landing push off and then there's also the strength component of it that can help to improve your technique even even just um, you know exercises like a step up or a, something where you're getting I guess a mimicking of the running motion with some extra weight and some repetition and uh, building strength in those really specific uh, positions that you're in when you're running. So I think, uh, I think the combination of those can, can in a lot of cases be enough, but there are, there are certainly people that may need a little more help and there are running technique coaches and um, even physio, a lot of physios will do gait analysis. And, and again, they can, can give you some tips on that, but I, I don't necessarily think that everybody needs to, to be taught how to run because again, there are, there are some big differences between uh, people's natural physique and uh, strengths and weaknesses, which are probably going to be there anyway. But like you said, with other sports, we get, we get taught a lot with correct technique to improve efficiency and improve performance. And, and I think if you're looking to do that with your running, then yeah, it's certainly something that's worth looking into, particularly if you're having, trouble or you feel like you're not improving and you want to get that next, um, get to that next level. Yeah, really well answered. I think, I think you're definitely right. I think everyone can run, but some people will need a little bit more guidance than others. You know, there'll be those people that have never seen a running coach or a physio or strength inducing coach in their life and they get through 60 years of running, no problem. But some people yeah. will need more guidance than others. Um, but I still think that if you are struggling with injuries and you're not able to achieve what you want to achieve with your goals and you keep breaking down these sort of things, I still think that, yes, that's when you potentially need to go and see a physio strength coach, running coach to tighten things up a little bit. And I, I think just learn a little bit more about what you should be doing. Um, yeah, certainly. And often when somebody's injured or even listening to people's injury history, often there's a little bit of a pattern um, there that then you analyze their gait or you, you know, you video their running technique and you can see straight away why they keep getting those particular injuries. And, and that might be a matter of just a few, a few tweaks to try and help them again to offload those areas or strengthen those areas or. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the fundamentals are often there and I, I often don't have to do too much with a runner. I might only just have to tweak up their running volume. I might just have to give them one or two little cues with their technique and away we go. So often the, the basis is there of a pretty solid runner, you know, 90, 80% might be done, ready to go. And then you might need to make a few slight adjustments. But I think one of the big adjustments people need to make is what we discussed last podcast of doing more K's and the longer distance Ks at a slower pace, managing your training volume is so important because people just go, especially during COVID, people have gone to from like 10 Ks a week to 20 Ks a week really quickly. And then that spike has caused um, obviously too much load and then they get injured. I think it's really important to um, peel things back and do the right things slowly. And I think the yeah. training, training volume increases that need to be done slowly, don't they, Elle? Yeah, for sure. And like we talked about last time too, the the strides or the the sprint work as well can be really beneficial to helping with your technique just because often you'll see when people run really slowly, sometimes they actually uh, deteriorate as far as technique goes. Whereas when you get people running quickly, they're engaging more and they're really, you know, pumping their arms and, and pushing off using their calves and their glutes and all of that. So I think uh, doing drills and strides and things like that are an important component of approving efficiency and um, yeah, activating and strengthening, I guess, all the right muscles. Yeah, for sure. Last question now, orthotics, when are they appropriate and why do we use them? Yeah. So I think, uh, 
in a lot of cases they're they're not required I'm actually currently wearing an orthotic in my shoe for the first time in my life um, I'm trying to offload a couple of parts of my foot whilst maintaining very high mileage so I reluctantly agreed to to try some orthotics and to be honest they've actually been <laughs> extremely helpful um, but I think sometimes people jump into orthotics too early or look at them as a permanent part of their footwear as opposed to a temporary thing which can be really benefit beneficial again to try and offload a certain area or um, you know there's lots of different uses for them foot injuries knee injuries hip injuries but I think in in most cases you want to look at the underlying cause of that as well which is often a strength issue or um, occasionally a mobility issue and and try and really focus in on that and look at the orthotic as something that might be helpful in the short term but you know unless there's anything drastically structural going on there I think long term again you want to be uh, getting stronger and addressing those issues in other ways yeah amen to that thoughts? yeah amen to that I, I think <laughs> Orthotics should never be viewed as a permanent solution unless there's an underlying issue, e.g., you know, cerebral palsy or something like that. Someone will need an orthosis for the rest of their life, potentially. But I 100% agree that they should never be viewed as a permanent solution. And weaning out of them is so important. They're good in the acute phase, like you're kind of dealing with at the moment, and it's allowed you to do some running volume as you prepare to go to London. We'll chat about that in a sec. Um, so yeah, I, I think that the notion that once you get orthotics, you need orthotics for the rest of your life, that needs to change. Um, people yeah. do not need orthotics for the rest of their life unless there's an underlying condition that requires them. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, thanks for coming on L. I think that was short and sharp. I think that was about 30 minutes and a lot, all the listeners are going to get a heap out of that. So thank you very much. Quick one. You're going to London soon. What's on? Uh, yeah, so I'm racing the London Marathon on October 4th. So it was originally scheduled for April. It then got postponed with COVID. And then now it's been uh, modified. So it's uh, an elite only race with 20 laps around Buckingham Palace, essentially. No crowds, secure biosphere, they're calling it. So it'll be a very different experience. That's for sure. Um, yeah. So I'm training as hard as I can with a pretty limited time frame to try and get fit for that. It sounds like a fast field. <laughs> yeah. I was going to, it's, it sounds like a pretty boring race as in it's just going to yeah. be around and around in circles. Is it? Yeah, I think so. It's, it's apparently a really flat loop. So it was the one that they originally wanted to use for the INEOS 159 event and they couldn't get approval, I think, from the London City Council or whatever it is because they would have had to close the roads for too long. So it's apparently very flat, very fast. Um, it will be, I think it will be fine if you're running in a pack. I think if you get dropped from the pack 10Ks in, it will be a long 32 Ks to the finish solo without anybody cheering. <laughs> yeah, seriously. But, no um, crowd. That'll be hard. <laughs> oh yeah. It'll be weird. I think they, they mentioned that they're going to try and have some sort of virtual crowd thing happening, but it will be bizarre. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a different experience and it's an opportunity to race, which we haven't had this year and may not have for quite a while after. So um, I'm going to take every chance I can get at the moment. What, uh, what date is the, the run and how can we watch it if you, we want to watch it in Australia? Yeah, so it's on October 4th. There'll be a live stream of it. I read the other day, I think, that there was going to be a, li a free live stream worldwide, probably on YouTube. It will be on BBC as well, but I'm not sure exactly how you'll be able to view it in Australia. But they do the women's race first, then the men's race Um both world record holders are in it. So it'll be really exciting to watch. I think it's Kipchoge versus Bikili in the men's. Um, yeah. And it's on a Sunday. So it'll be on like a Sunday afternoon, our time. So it's actually pretty good viewing time for Australia. But you probably won't see me for long. <laughs> <laughs> well, Maybe the first 20 seconds. 
Well, I'll look forward to watching. I, I'll have to definitely tune in. And for the listeners, we've talked about technique today. And if you're watching that race, have a look at the techniques, especially of the top line guys like Bekele and um, Kipchoge. And even just look out yeah. for L. Your your technique solid as a rock. So watch watch L's technique. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Mine's actually not very good. Yes, it it's is. interesting though um, the different because the, yeah, you're right. Those two guys have both got beautiful running techniques. But Bridget Cosguy, who's the female world record holder, she I would say doesn't look super efficient when she runs. She's got quite a lot of trunk rotation and not a lot of arm movement. But uh, she's very 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 fast. So. Yeah, it's it's fascinating with the East African runners because there are there are some not so great techniques there, and they can still run ridiculously fast times. So, yeah, it's, it's, it keeps it interesting. A lot of ways to skin a cat, like with any sport. You know, there's a lot of ways to swing a golf club or a tennis racket or a cricket bat. So much the same with running, but the fundamentals need to be done correctly. Um, now, L. Where can we find you in terms of Instagram and uh, website, all that sort of stuff? Because I know you do a lot of running coaching yourself online. Uh, yeah, so at my coaching business that I have with Julian, my coach is called Run Strong Online Coaching. And our website is just www.runstrongonlinecoaching.com.au. We've got an Instagram page called Run Strong Online Coaching too. And then I'm on Instagram as uh, Elio Pash. But it's not very exciting, my Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's all right. I saw, saw you went for a run the other morning uh, along the beach. Oh, yeah. That was probably the best post I've ever done, actually. We did a sunrise run and it was low tide along the cliffs below Anglesey. So that was, that was pretty nice. You got up early. I thought you weren't an early riser. Yeah, I'm not. I'm, at the moment, I'm doing big long runs. So I had to run 38 Ks that day. So I'm starting early because otherwise, yeah, I feel like I'm out there all day. 38 so. Ks. Where are we? Well, yeah. good luck in, good luck when you go to mar- uh, the marathon in London. I'll be cheering you on and I hope the rest of Australia Thanks, is. Um, you can find me at wildphysiofitness.com.au and Wild Physio Fitness on all socials. This podcast is live on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Have you got any last words, Elle? Uh, I don't any think so. I, I guess words of wisdom, words of <laughs> words of wisdom for the runners out there. Well, I I just hope that everybody keeps it up. Especially, there's a lot of new runners during this this COVID time, and I hope that people use all the fitness that they've gained and and keep it going because. As much as it's good at the moment, it's so much more fun running when there are events to do and fun runs, road races, all sorts of things. So if you haven't done anything like that before, then I'd highly recommend it once they once they start back up again. Yeah, for sure. Get out there and start competing when you can. Um, And as usual, guys, stay strong.